joining us today. My name is Marnie Watson and I am the Managing Director for Australia and New Zealand for Sun MS4. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Rory O'Toole, who is our Global Solutions Director. And I will momentarily introduce Rory in more detail. Firstly, though, let me acknowledge and pay my respects to the ancestors, elders and family of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and recognise their continuing connection to land, uh, waters and culture. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which you're joining us today. We are going to have a chat today about managing international student recruitment. And we're going to specifically focus in on admissions. Um, we cover off the full spectrum of enrollment services, but we're focusing on admissions because this is really what we're hearing and seeing a lot about at the moment. My deeply experienced colleague, Rory, is going to lead today's conversation. Rory is responsible for the evolution of Sun MS4's service offerings and is specifically leading on our suite of services um, across PACE. And PACE stands for Prospect, Admit, Convert and Enroll. And so that basically takes us through lead generation, digital marketing lead generation, admissions, conversion, compliance through to enrollment with today's focus being on admissions, as I said. Rory's held roles spanning uh, students recruitment, uh, business development, digital marketing, uh, strategy and managed services. And prior to Sun MS4, Rory was with uh, QS Enrollment Services. Uh, my background is predominantly leading global student recruitment teams. Uh, and I, what's relevant to this experience and this conversation is that I helped to establish uh, my previous organization's shared service center in Singapore, which grew to over 100 staff who were involved in admissions, conversion, uh, compliance and direct student recruitment as well. And that really gave me some valu valuable insights into uh, the power of clear feedback loops uh, between student recruitment teams and admissions and agents and also uh, compliance and finance teams as well. Today's conversation I think is particularly relevant given our imminently opening international borders and the really excitingly positive um, application and enrollment impact that we're already starting to see across Australian education providers. We're also really conscious of the staff reductions that have occurred across Australia over the last 18 months in universities and the resulting, um, if you like, brain drain that's happened as we've lost specialised staff who work in really highly important areas of international education, um, student recruitment and especially in admissions. So Rory is going to share insights around dealing with challenges often faced in the world of admissions. And he's going to share perspectives um, from his global experience. And so, Rory, with that introduction, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Barney, and welcome, everybody. Great to have you with us. I'm just going to share my screen. So I think I think we're on, which is great. So, yes, yeah, just to reiterate, yeah, welcome, everybody, and, and looking forward to walking through the session with you. And um, if there are any questions, please do type them in the chat and, and Marnie will prompt me, otherwise we can save them to the end of the session today. So just a quick rundown of the agenda, which built, uh, building on some of the background Marnie's provided. Firstly, we just look to um, set the scene and recap some of the challenges that we're seeing um, across uh, international student recruitment markets globally. Um, very applicable, I think, to um, the Australia New Zealand context though. Um, then just give you a quick view on what we mean by the admissions process and, and I'm sure there is quite a, a common um, con conception of that but equally just for just for background. Then uh, a very brief uh, case study to try and um, demonstrate or at least outline concisely how we're involved in this sort of work as San MS4 and then just based on that experience some observations and best practice quick summary and then leaving time for questions at the end. Okay, so as, as Marnie's been alluding to, I think we're Australia, New Zealand, very much poised for a reopening of international student flows and, and looking to other markets like the UK can maybe give us a glimpse into the future. Um, I'm sure some of you will be aware, but there's uh, been a real spike in interest, really, really significant volumes um, of applications, offers issued and actually most tangibly in record number of student visas issued in the UK. 
Um, and, and that has presented real opportunity, but also challenges. You know, it's very, it's been clear that volume is possible to generate volume of interest across various stages of the student journey, but it's not always possible to drive consistent quality. And, and I think that then leads to uh, pinch points, knock on effects, challenges with interpretation of information. And it's those sorts of things that through the admissions process, we, we, we aim to support partners with, but also like to share some thoughts with how you as teams can do that as well. Um, some of this, uh, you know, may not be uh, new to you, but equally, hopefully, um, a degree of, uh, you know, validation or reiteration, or at least the sense that uh, you're looking at things in the right way. Okay, so to sort of uh, summarise the challenges, um, there, there's sort of six six areas uh, uh, at least, and, and some of these, of course, have subcategories within them. But in various markets, we're seeing problems of volume and, and resultant workload. You know, that that could be that there is lots of team members involved in the admissions process, but there's just loads to get into. It could be that there's been contraction of teams because of um, pressure on on budgets and and sort of you know pandemic pandemic related pressure which we none of us can ignore um there's challenges with data and decision making based on accurate data so what does does volume and unpredictability do to um teams ability to interpret information and make informed decisions uh again in that same environment of volume meets resource crunch um how, how and what do you prioritize um that's a, a theme through through the presentation and certainly a key takeaway of it's important to think about where to place your bets as a team um, if you can't do everything um, and there's not many teams that can do everything um, with that sort of opening up of, of student flows and, and demand increasing from um, newer areas newer territories um, parts of countries that that teams are less familiar with there's an increased risk of potentially fraudulent applications. Um, and if teams are stretched, it can also lead to, you know, um, pressures on ability to scrutinize with the, the sort of level of rigor that, that maybe we'd like to, as I mentioned already, potentially uh, pressure on budgets. And of course, always looming large, um, there's the pressure to grow and to bounce back from from the impact of, of the pandemic you know tar targets very rarely get smaller um, and that's all in the context of this uh this sort of background and and uh environment in which we're all operating at the moment so next just on to what we mean i suppose as sanmes for just for clarity as admissions um now really what we're talking about at least for the purpose of the day is if you think of the student journey you've got lead and inquiry stage so early on when when a prospective student first comes into the pipeline um then they've actually submitted an application or started or opened an application that's the point at which for us for the purpose of today that admissions process starts it's when someone progresses from lead to you know not lead and goes further down the funnel and we also i think uh, for our kind of operational purposes and work with partners we include the um kind of compliance and GTE in Australia context uh, stage in the admissions process it tends to be handled by similar teams and and isn't really a sort of conversion or later uh, or a, a sort of customer service or conversion type process. And sure, there could be some debate on this, but just for the purpose of today, this is uh, this is how we would categorise the the flow. I think really importantly as well, these are very uh interconnected stages um and and certainly some of the lessons that we've seen and the best practice that we see is that teams are treating each of these stages as uh independent segments of a process that can be refined and optimized but when you add them together and you've done that uh, individual sort of layers of optimization you'll compound the impact um so we're going to look at some of these areas uh in in the examples or in the, the uh, uh subsequent slides so a very brief um case study just to, to kind of demonstrate um some of our work or a common example of, of the sort of uh, challenges we see and 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 uh areas that teams try to focus on to improve their work so we as a business are very um uh, we have a very long-standing service offering in in, uh, in country representation so we facilitate and um enable many many in, um, universities to operate in in growth markets and 
one of the goals of those income re representatives is generally to build really strong, resilient, productive agent networks, collaborate with um, agents, also collaborate with schools, direct student recruitment as well, of course. But it's all always a focus generally of, of our agents because, uh, sorry, our in-country reps working with agents because they can really get close to those stakeholders and agents really critical stakeholder in the student recruitment process. What we see can happen is um, those in-country representatives do an awful lot of work building the agent network, creating a really strong reputation, um, having uh, a really tangible, um, strong student pipeline. But what can, and so agents are happy, but what can happen is that there's a pinch point that can quite quickly emerge when that volume of agent applicants comes through uh, the workflow to admissions. And, and, and actually a very recent example uh, that this is based on uh, is exactly what happened. So really a lot of positive work was done at the front end of the process, but then because of insufficient resources and volume or one that's driving the other, agents start to get a little bit disgruntled. They're, they're thinking, well, I need my applications to be processed more quickly, you know, rightly, because they want to offer really good service um, to their prospective students, as does the institution by extension. Um, so this created that pinch point. And we took over the process, uh, the end-to-end -end admissions process that we've just explained on a previous slide, and managed to reduce the turnaround time um, quite markedly down to 24, 48 hours, ensuring that the agents were then, you know, happy, satisfied, content again. Now, there's smiley faces on this slide, and this is a vast oversimplification. And, and you know, I, I, it's not quite the case that, you know, within minutes we come in and um, the, the, the turnaround time is reduced. But what I wanted to do was just show this because it is quite a common example of have us having to work with uh, partners and, and get under the skin of what's actually the root cause of the challenges that are um, leading to these pinch points. Because it's not quite as simple as just, um, turn apps around more quick, more quickly, and the the agents or the stakeholders are happy. There's always a bit more to it than that. And actually, again, just to reiterate, the optimizations or the improvements that you can make are at various different stages of the process. And it's not just a sort of silver bullet approach to this. So one of the first areas um, that just worth highlighting is is to try and tackle uh, incomplete applications. So this uh, very early part of the process, and, and again, for the purpose of um, uh, definition, we're talking about an application that's been submitted and may appear as a sort of submitted application on data, but it's got insufficient information for a decision to be made. So you, you may look at it and you may think, all oh, right, tick, applications come through, but actually when it gets to the to, to admissions team or the team sort of processing the applications, it's actually, it could be scarcely populated, barely anything to it, but, uh, and so it causes a bit of a pinch point straight away. Now, just the first thing to do here, I think, is to understand the segment, uh, to try and tackle the problem. So we see, and I've had, and colleagues will have had several conversations in which there isn't necessarily a common approach to tackling this segment um, at partner institutions. It, it, for, you know, do, 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 do you even know if they exist in your workflow? Is there a shared understanding of, of what they are? You know, is, is one, is an incomplete application in your admissions workflow? Um, 10 pieces of information missing? Is it one piece of information missing? Because that level of understanding can tailor what you do with them and should tailor what you do with them. Um, really importantly as well, how are they categorized? Now that, that, there may not even be a tag or a label for these sorts of apps. And what that means, uh, I think we find from a kind of risk perspective is they could be going into the hopper of an application and, um, you know, sort of polluting the data. So you think you've got a thousand applications, but actually 50% of them are incomplete, which then can impact your ability to um, uh, accurately forecast uh, work plan, workload, plan resources, uh, you know, if, if actually you can't progress those applications, but, but you're viewing them as a potential uh, hot prospective student, there's real risk there in terms of how you understand what's gonna come down the line um, from your kind of planning, um, planning, from a planning perspective. So we, we would really encourage you to kind of look at the source of these, 
uh, i.e. agent or direct or from particular markets, particular territories, what's the cause? Um, is it because uh, you know there's lack of clarity at the front end, um, understanding what needs to be submitted? And then it's about what, what can you do to engage with these? So it, we find a, a combination of kind of manual and automated interventions, so triggering email notifications uh, to, to outline to prospective students um, or agents that the application is incomplete is really helpful because actually many of them don't know that their application is incomplete. Um, and then looking at uh, just acknowledging the fact that it's kind of a balance to strike in this area when you try and tackle this challenge, because on the one hand, it could be caused by the fact that, say, fields on the application form aren't mandatory. So it, you, it may just be very, very basic information that you can uh, sub enter and then submit to trigger sort of a live application. Um, which could be a good thing. It's viewed you know, tactically by some institutions that that's a positive to capture that data quickly. But on the flip side, if you're spending lots of time chasing incomplete applications instead of processing complete ones, that's creating a tension and a, and a challenge. So I think the first, just to recap on this one, first things first is to kind of understand the segment and then try and engage with them as quickly as possible. Uh, there's, uh, we do find that if you can tackle uh, this segment quickly, you can have a real impact on progressing these incomplete to complete applications. And that tends to happen in, a, in the first couple of weeks. Beyond that, they tend to go a bit cold. Um, of course, in the context of the wider conversion approach, these are hotter than a lead. You know, they've taken a more tangible step. So it's a good uh, area for, for you know, recruitment or conversion colleagues to focus because they, uh, they you know, they're more advanced than a lead captured um, from a from another source. Choice to make around prioritization, deprioritization. If they start to go cool, stop working with them. That's a really important point. And then uh, intervene uh, early to try and tackle this early on because it's going to uh, flow through for the rest of the pipeline, the rest of the funnel. And I just highlight on this slide finally that these two these two uh, observations around making a choice to prioritize and deprioritize, and intervening early in in with these challenges is a really important principle, regardless of which stage of the admissions process we're looking at. Okay. Secondly, just looking at uh, another best practice that we see um, is inter-team collaboration. So uh, the, the sort of best uh, processes that we see rely on um, really strong relationships between on campus and in-country teams. And, and, and they create a very strong um, ongoing and live feedback loop. And that's where you're taking the valuable insights that you can derive from both teams and blending them together to improve what you're doing. So the in-country teams can provide really useful information in market around, you know, entry requirements, you know, ear to the ground on turnaround time, what they're hearing um, might be kind of incentives or, or scholarship offerings and the like that, that could be offered in market. They can support with tailoring of messaging. Um, you know, are you asking for things in the admissions process that are going to resonate, are going to be understood by the local audience? Um, because terminology may be different, and that's where an in-country team can really help you. Um, and then you can also get access into uh, policy changes and those factors that are um, enabling or preventing applicants from progressing can be derived from both parts, both teams. So just to go back to another example um, to demonstrate this principle, I think, and also building on this sort of earlier case study, if you look at the agent example again, um, you might find that a particular agent when you look at the data that you have is sending uh, a high volume of applications but you when you kind of get under the skin slightly and work with um, your team to understand the data and information those applications aren't necessarily the same they're not all sort of created equal what we find in this case with this particular agent is you've got one completed application three incomplete applications one that's got uh, you know borderline um grades and requires faculty input, one that has completed application, but with non-approved transcripts, for example. And those, uh, while you sort of look at it in the context of six applications, it may not look, look too impactful. When this is multiplied, when you're dealing with really significant volume, it can cause quite significant knock-on effects because it's creating those roadblocks and those pinch points throughout the process, um, which 
really sort of manifesting slower turnaround times generally, um, you know, time wasted potentially chasing, um, higher quality candidates are lost in the backlogs because created by the significant volume. You may be falling short in terms of offer issuance and turnaround time, losing out to competitors. And that state, that time between um, that sort of first application to an applicant being able to move into the kind of conversion stage and nurture stage is delayed because that you haven't had the information or you haven't had the ability to process an application quickly. So the, the, the central piece of advice here is try and drill down into um, the root causes of these challenges. And this really is a function that can be supported by the admissions team in that circle. So it's what are we seeing in the data that um, that is uh, preventing applications from progressing. Our experience and work and seeing with other partners is there tend to be common or recurring reasons. Um, so it may be that, uh, you know, an in incomplete application point, there's just not enough information. It, it might be that, uh, you know, there's transcripts are in the wrong format or that there's, there's lack of translation or, um, you know, that the, there's a very sort of common or prevailing problem. So that's where the admissions team has highlighted that to the recruitment team. And then the recruitment team can close that loop and provide that feedback back to agents um, and, and, and reiterate um, the need for particular documents in a particular way, um, or, or just simply say, look, you've got to do it like this because it's our expectation. And then what that does is it mitigates that problem at the top of the funnel. So you're not then causing those pinch points further down the process. And, and, and really importantly as well, it's not just about agents. That closed loop of feedback can be used for uh, to support conversion for all applicants. And the way we see that done particularly well is noticing those common themes, those common challenges, and delivering you know a webinar on the admissions process that explicitly ad addresses those challenges head on, um, and, and and outlining you know, tips and tricks or how to apply or key points of reiteration. And that, of course, in the context of the pandemic, um, use of webinars has been really prevalent. And, and, you know, generally speaking, these admissions or procedural webinars are a really good foil to the softer brand and lifestyle webinars that we also see. So in this feedback section, key recommendations are, um, it's really important to create a forum to discuss the data. So um, I, I'm not gonna assume that this happens in all cases, but where we see it does, it does, it does add a lot of value. You know, are you working across teams and actually looking at the admissions data collectively? Because there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from it. Um, look at kind of performance and break, and break down by channel. And I'll show some kind of dashboard examples as we progress through the presentation always seek to close the loop you know don't don't assume that um the next step has happened that 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 um that, that the action has been taken and i think that's just you know a symptom of, of good teamwork and good follow through just making sure that that someone's responsible for the action someone's responsible for the step then a couple of other um related observations um you know uh, that building on what we've said so far i think one uh one focus area can be creating a priority and non-priority workflow. I think we see uh, successful teams um, make these sort of strategic choices where to place their bets in, in, in a landscape of having to do lots of different things, not necessarily with unlimited resources. There's got to be decisions made about what to, um, what to prioritize. You know, is that um, outreach to particular applicants were in a particular stage so unconditionals versus conditionals or is it um creating a, a segment of priority agents or um making a distinction between agent assisted or direct applicants um example being that in some markets it can be quite binary that <clears throat> if you're a direct applicant um, your likelihood of progressing is quite low, or if you're an agent applicant, your likelihood of progressing and enrolling is quite high. So get under the skin of that data and try and understand um, those parameters that are driving best performance and maybe create a priority segment that kind of reinforces that. Of course, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the more you prioritize, the more you might kind of validate that and, and create a, um, a, a yes, yeah, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy around it, but it's definitely worth considering. We do see that as quite a common feature. Um, and then standardization. I think working, trying to um, 
standardize as much of the process and as much of the decision making as possible is a really common feature of, su of successful processes. Um, it allows for uh, scaling and, and repeatability. So one of the questions I think worth asking is, can the way of working, can the decision making process, can the way you conduct the admissions work be turned into a, you know, a document or a matrix or a training guide? In other words, can you codify it? Um, could someone that's never done it before pick it up and actually follow it? Or have you got lots of nuance and kind of um, uh, case by case approaches to the work? Because that limits the ability to scale. If you're having to kind of assess um, sort of holistically or with a bit more kind of context or making assessing cases, um, lots and lots of cases uh, uh, with, with less sort of binary decision making, it can create those pinch points. So looking at where those common reasons for escalation to academics, common reasons uh, or issues that have led to borderline cases, try and tackle those at source. Uh, but for those that require a very common challenge is those academic interventions. W what is those decisions to, to sort of allow borderline cases or look at the background of an applicant? Can you try and standardize those and turn them into a bit of a rubric? Next point is using data. Um, so all of these observations wouldn't be possible without getting hold of data. Um, and, and all of these actions will create data as well. So um, I, I, again, not going to assume that these sorts of things happen, but using data in those um, meetings, in those kind of team sessions, looking at the sort of really key kind of admissions metrics like turnaround time, proportion of cases that are escalated, what's the overall volume, what ratio of applications are com complete and incomplete, splitting them by direct versus agent, um, what country they're from, what program they're from, and then overlaying all of those things with each other. So you could look at a case where, you know, how many uh, applications for that program from that country is that agent providing? And that sort of analysis is going to give you the ability to, you know, of course, interrogate the data and understand where to improve processes and, of course, test assumptions that you might have as well. And I, I, this is this is perhaps one of the most obvious um, and, and it's real, real kind of democratization and use of data institutions, which is great to see, but worth reiterating. So next point is uh, localization and kind of leveraging of local expertise. I think um, the the there is a nuance by market in admissions processes, and particularly when you get into kind of um, comprehension of documents, financial validation, um, translation of information, but then also as we progress to that kind of compliance uh, stage as well, when we're looking at um, credibility of applicants, which is something that, that happens in um, many markets, um, leveraging that kind of local insight and cultural affinity that can come with um, local teams can add a, a lot of value. Um, and practically as well, by working in you know multiple geographies, you can kind of leverage the extended time zone benefit that you get. So uh, particularly useful when maybe an on-campus team has finished their day, they can hand over work to the international team, come back and that cycle continues of work just being done more quickly, particularly beneficial when there's really high volumes of work to be done. Okay. And at, at next, moving on to some thoughts on, on GTE, which are you know, particularly uh, important, of course, in the Australia context, but, but, but broadly indicative of um, some processes in, in other markets like the UK, there's this similar process. So I thought we'd call this out particularly because um, it, there's quite a wide variety of pro approaches um, on this, in this related area of GTE and compliance. Um, and with this sort of forthcoming, potential spike in volume or resource pressure that can result in or may result in increased risks uh, or higher risk applicants. So we would expect that um, compliance processes uh, or enhanced compliance processes will become increasingly vital for colleagues in you know, Australia, New Zealand and other markets as well. Um, so just wanted to offer some thoughts about where we see this as a really strong process. And in simple terms, <clears throat> the best versions sort of tend to have three key components, um, <clears throat> some of which may be familiar, all of which may be familiar to you. Um, the first is the sort of assessment questionnaire. So that's gathering that early information 
about um, the applicant, so their personal information, dependents, family, if they've got family in, in the country, their funding, income status, uh, you know, supporting documents like passports, proof of English and the like. So that kind of paper, paper-based approach or, or electronic paper-based approach. Um, where we see another layer of sophistication added is, is with sort of a scoring mechanism. So this is going back to that point of standardization and creating a, a, a methodology or a scalable process for assessing um, this assessing uh, GT. So that's where you'd create a, a, a file, a document that, that has um, attributes scored and you're looking for a tipping point where the applicant has you know, a potential score that puts them in a high risk category. So you're looking at high risk geographical regions, gaps in study, resets, um, and if there's really high risk criteria, you might have a score or a binary decision point where, look, if someone has category, if someone has characteristic X on their application, they're too high risk. Um, otherwise, it could be a combination of factors that give them a score that allows them to progress and not progress and uh, be successful in this process. Then the final stage that we're seeing a lot of um, uh, partners start to introduce is actually uh, a video interview stage. So this uh, is deployed in a variety of different ways. It could be for all applicants that reach this stage, or it could be for um, particular segments. And again, that's about those strategic choices. Where do you decide to intervene? Where do you decide to improve the process? So it could be for borderline cases. It could be from non-priority agents. It could be from direct applicants. Um, but, and typically we see this delivered by in-country teams to kind of leverage that local expertise. So it may be that there's a, for the uh, India, uh, market or particular segment of the India market, these interviews are being conducted by a team based in India to, to leverage all those benefits we've spoken about before. Okay, and just very, very simply, um, this is a some basic high level operational flow uh, used to, that we would use to, to execute those interviews. It, it is flexed and, and changes depending on um, needs from partners, um, but typically we'd do that financial assessment, which has happened earlier on, as we've spoken about. There'd be a data exchange, of course, if we're conducting the work with a partner. We would allocate the tasks and make sure that interviews are um, scheduled. We'd conduct the proactive outreach. So it's, it's making sure that there's visibility on who's been scheduled, um, when are they scheduled, um, any, any reasons why scheduling isn't happening effectively, because this is such an important part of the process. You want to make sure that um, the, the the ground is covered as quickly and effectively as possible and we're spotting any problems with it. There'd be a document screening stage to make sure that the team's prepared to understand um, the nature of the applicant and what they're um, what to expect on an interview. The interview is conducted typically on a you know platform like Zoom or very or a particular piece of technology that we also deploy in some cases. Um, then there would be a, a non-attendee process or a reminder to those that don't attend again, because that's such an important stage, understanding why people aren't attending. What does that mean for their likelihood of progressing through the process? Um, then we'd track outcomes. So against uh, the, the methodology for assessing the applicant and those uh, outcomes are then shared with the partner. Okay, just, just in summary, um, just to reiterate, I think, it's really important to treat each stage of the admissions process as important. The benefit from being blended together, um, but actually you can start to look at things and tweak small things that will add up to, to make a big difference. Um, but also be mindful that you might create a bit of kind of whack-a-mole scenario where you solve one problem. So if you look at incomplete applications, you create a real surge and flow through of completed applications. But if you haven't got the capacity to tackle those, you may create another problem. So try and get around or get your head around. Um, if I do this, what will it mean later on in the process? It's also really important, as I've said on a couple of occasions, to make choices to prioritize and deprioritize. Um, you may not be able to do everything. So that's a quite an important thought process. And then finally, use data to create benchmarks, um, a, a sort of sense and culture of transparency. So you may not understand all the data initially, and, and there's a, there can be an awful lot of granularity and it could be quite um, overwhelming. And, and um, certainly uh, there's always a lot to get into. 
but at least if you're starting to talk about it and get under the skin of it and create that shared understanding it will allow that effective optimization and ability for everybody to kind of talk the same language on where to improve a process and i'll pause there and maybe invite marnie back on thanks I promised you i wouldn't leave you alone rory and uh, i am absolutely <laughs> here <laughs> <laughs> I thought about Always. coming in halfway through, to be honest with you, to say, you're not alone. And I thought, no, I'll just interrupt <laughs> your flow. Thank you so much for that. It's just really, I think, helpful um, granularity of insight. Um, so really, thank you. I've also got to note that I'm particularly pleased with the whack-a-mole analogy. That made me very smiley. Yeah, happy. yeah. I, I, hopefully, that's, um, hopefully that's a global uh, phrase and everybody <laughs> got that. But, I, I, you know, maybe another session we can elaborate on what that actually means if, uh, if, uh, if it didn't land. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, so, colleagues on the on the call, please um, type your questions in. There's two locations. It doesn't matter where you do it. So I've put a note into the little chat box. So please type in there. But there's also the Q and A section that you can type in. Um, so as you're thinking up your questions, um, maybe Rory, I might jump in with one. Um, just I realise this is probably a it's a, it's a sensitive question to ask, but nonetheless, I think it's potentially an interesting one to think about. What's your advice on how to take calculated risks um, in the admissions environment? So knowing that you've got a challenge of volume and speed of turnaround, but also you've got to be very careful with quality and compliance. Just maybe talk to us a little bit about your, your thoughts on how possibly or, or not at all would one take calculated risks? Yeah, I, I think that's, you've got a problem. So my feeling is you kind of got to go back to the data in the first instance and, and if, if there's a sort of precedent for quality from a particular source, is that something where you think, okay, well, maybe we can be a bit more uh, flexible, uh, you know, fle flexibility and risk maybe are kind of synonyms. I'm not sure in this context, mm -hmm. but it, 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 you wouldn't necessarily take more risk with an already risky, um, uh, risky source or a risky kind of um, uh, stakeholder or agent perhaps. Um, but, I think the other thing crucially is is the scale of which you take the risk isn't it mm. it's it's uh, and and provided that there's some learnings to be derived from it so it might be that you're trying a new process mm. um it might be that you're trying that kind of scoring mechanism mm. that we spoke yeah. about in the gte context if if you're introducing something new there's inherent risk with that mm -hmm. so i think it's about can you do, do create the rigor at the beginning have you thought about the parameters that are gonna um have you thought you know a region or a, a particular geography is a risk factor right mm -hmm. therefore we'll include that in our scoring matrix so you've made a conscious decision to think about a risk there but you might not get the regions right yeah but at least you've thought about the region so it's kind yes. of um i guess trying to be as broad and and, and sensible about your approach but acknowledging that it might not necessarily mm -hmm. be perfect and so they maybe test those sorts of things on a smaller group yeah. You know, and, and do test that test and learn mentality, I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I like your point around just define your parameters. So then you yeah. know actually what is your starting point to then be able to exactly. move those parameters. Um, here we go. We've got a question coming in. So um, Rory, just reading to you here, how to manage the relationships with applicants where the agent is involved. We've seen there are major cases where students are interested, but the documents were not processed by agents. Compliance and taking harsh calls may seem to be the obvious way, but how would you entertain that? So how do you manage the relationship with applicants where the agent is involved? We've seen cases where the student is interested, but the documents were not processed by agents. Compliance and taking harsh calls may seem to be an obvious way, but how would you entertain that? Yeah, really tricky. It, that is a yeah perennial challenge, I think. Um, I, there's not necessarily an obvious way to do it. I think I think. The, the communications approach. So if you think about say automated communications, that could be you know automated emails, for example, that are delivered on you know, marketing platforms. Uh, there's always, there's not really any way of knowing if that is going to the applicant or to, to the agent. So I think it's just being mindful that it could go to either, frankly, and acknowledging that you, you want to kind of encourage and incentivize the key stakeholder that is an agent to share that information so then think about you know the value of the information mm -hmm. is it worth them sharing does it does it provide them with a benefit um or you know add enable them to have an, a conversation enable them to convey um, the message from the institution um effectively 
or, or is it just generic and they know it already? So mm -hmm. I think if you look at maybe inwardly first and think, um, is what we're sending actually going to cut through, regardless of whether it goes to the applicant, the agent, that could be a good way to do it. Um, and then there's those practical things that, that could be more challenging about asking for um, the, the applicant's details, because you might not actually have those. That's That can prove quite challenging. I've seen that uh attempts of that to be made but it doesn't always land um mm. and that's you know understandable there's various stakeholders in this process and they all have interests but um no harm in asking you know mm. or you know we'd, we'd like and, and if you've got an a team that conducts outbound engagement with applicants and you happen to speak to the agent you can always ask could i could i speak to the to the applicant or am i even mm. speaking with the applicant am i speaking mm. to the agent so just understanding the sort of hit rate that you're yeah. getting yeah was one of the things we used to really struggle with in, in one of my past roles was um, efficiency of turnaround from our end. You know, we would hit that 48 hour turnaround, um, but then find out the student was not receiving their offer um, because the agent wasn't adhering to speedy turnaround. So um, it is just that whole, you know, really, I think coming back to your point around, uh, what was the phrase you used? Inter-team collaboration. So really identifying where are you getting um, repeated behaviours from agents who are yeah. not perhaps doing quite the right thing and, and really training, seeing that as a training opportunity. Um, and I'd flip that round as well, Marnie, as well, just so that that sort of inward, um, are you doing enough to support them? Yeah. Are they, you know, are they incentivized? I don't mean financially necessarily, but are they incentivized to work with you? And, and mm -hmm. do they feel like they've got, uh, they're they're valued. Valued so, yes, is a key word. Kind of, yes. Yeah, you know you can, um, and that you know that goes for any stakeholder. That goes for students mm. as well. You want to make them feel part of the um, potential students. That you make want to make them feel part of the institution as early as possible, and that sort of affinity. Uh, the sooner you can build that, the better. That mm -hmm. goes for anyone that's involved in the admissions or enrollment process. So, yeah, I think um, that don't assume just because they're sending applications that they want to uh, that they are going to go anywhere. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah, fair enough, absolutely. Um, uh, colleagues, I have another question for you, Rory, in a second, but just a heads up for colleagues, because there is a question here around um, re-watching a recording of this. Uh, so yes, rest assured, we've recorded it um, and we will distribute it to everyone who registered for the session today. Um, so you'll definitely get another chance to listen to Rory and all his knowledgeable insights. Um, Rory, do you think admission specific sessions conducted by universities for agents and or students can be of help um, to address cross-cultural cross references, for example. Um, could that be too much of interaction or do you think that that would be valuable? Yeah, no, I, I think um, I, I definitely think that those specific sessions are valuable. I think uh, practically you've maybe got a uh, uh, capacity challenge. Can you do a session for every specific market, mm. every specific topic? So go back to the to the point made earlier around commonality and recurring themes, try and get a handle on those and tackle those first and foremost, and then tackle those at scale. You know, you create the webinar, um, we're creating a recording here. You would create a recording and you can kind of repurpose that, send that out in communications afterwards. Um, but yeah, the, 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 if you've got the ability to do it, the tailoring to local context or a specific market context via those webinars and admissions related sessions is really valuable, mm. I think. Yeah. And, it, and again, it creates that sense that the institution has acknowledged the difference and is catering to the difference and cares about the difference, which is a good, a good message to send, I think, to potential mm -hmm. students. Yeah. Um, follow up question here around uh, what types of incentives would you suggest? So I think you'd made a comment around incentivization. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm going to steer away from the commercial incentives. <laughs> I don't think that's not necessarily my place to comment on that. But I, I, I'm, as I say, I'm thinking really more about engagement, you know, ha, ha, that, that when when you're working with it, as I said a moment ago, you know, a student, a, a potential student's a stakeholder that they need to feel valued, they need to feel, um, you know, a, a sense of affinity with the institution goes to it's the same for for an agent, you know, you can't, you can't expect a, a really critical stakeholder like that to uh, work well with you if you're not supporting them. And, and mm -hmm. I think in any in any sort of B2B relationship more generally, it's about having you know shared understanding of objectives it's about um making sure that you know teams are aligned and there's open communication and people feel equipped 
that they've got resources. So I think, yeah, really it's about that. It's, it's are you giving these that critical stakeholder group enough to warrant them working or, or you know, working hard for you as well? Mm -hmm. So less part commercial, which I won't comment on, but, but much more about kind of the collaboration side, I think. Yeah, fantastic, Rory. Um, Rory, I'm going to wrap us up there and just say a very big thank you to you for sharing your insights. Um, I think the comment you made right at the beginning around the fact that um, you know we've seen significant uh, growth in UK applications and enrolments but also quality challenges coming through as that really escalated I think that's really good um, learning for us in Australia and New Zealand to be thinking about that as we we head into January with the with the borders opening so thank you for that um, it's been lovely joining you sorry I went away and left you on your own but um, much appreciated and colleagues uh, lovely to have you join us and we'll send through the recording in the next couple of days Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye.